Well, you've been uh, in a series that's going to lead you up to Easter here called Costly Grace. And there can be kind of a, a danger with grace because it is so freely given to us. It can seem like it comes cheap. But the truth is it comes at a great cost, especially when we look at the price that Jesus paid. But a benefit to us of that costly grace is forgiveness. We're going to talk a little bit about forgiveness today. Psalm 103 was referenced by Brad last week. We read some early verses together earlier this morning, but I want to go ahead and focus in on a few verses in the middle of Psalm 103 that provide a beautiful description of what God's forgiveness is like. Picking up in verse 8 of Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. A beautiful description, again, of, of God's forgiveness. And you've probably heard the phrase, forgive and forget, right? As a way that we should forgive. When God forgives us, he, he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west and kind of forgets about it. And so if we're gonna forgive like God forgives, we need to forgive and forget. And the idea that God completely forgets our sin when he forgives is one that seems to be taught in Scripture. We'll look at a couple of examples. Jeremiah chapter 31 is one example. In verse 34, we read this. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they all will know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And in Micah chapter 7, verse 19, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all, all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Forgive and forget. That's what God does. That's what we should do, right? And yet that can be tough. Have you ever struggled with forgiveness and forgiving and forgetting? Author and theologian uh, C.S. Lewis said something we probably all relate to. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And then all of a sudden it's a little more difficult. And I can remember a season in ministry when I struggled to forgive like I thought I should. I was the preacher of a little country church in Missouri. I was attending Bible college in Missouri. And at the age of 19, this country church hired me to be their preacher. Can you imagine how desperate for a preacher they were? <laughs> hired a 19-year-old kid to be their preacher. And in that church was a woman that we'll call Mary. And Mary had a reputation for not being the most warm and fuzzy person in terms of personality. In fact, she'd had uh, seasons of conflict with it seemed like just about everybody in the church at one point or another. Uh, but in my first several months as the, the pastor of that little church, Mary and I got along great. And I actually kind of took a little bit of pride in that. Uh, I'd heard stories of people having difficulties getting along with Mary, and yet she and I got along well. Well, that all changed one day. There was a, a decision made by the church. It was a decision made by a congregational vote. It was a decision that two-thirds of the congregation voted uh, in the same way, but Mary was in the third minority, and she blamed me for the fact that the decision didn't go the way she wanted. And so from that day forward, the dy dynamic of my relationship with Mary was very different. Now, in that day, we had a Sunday school hour at church with classes for all different ages, followed by the worship hour at church. And Mary taught a Sunday school class. So she would come to church and she would teach her Sunday school class, but then she would leave before the worship hour, in part because as the preacher of that little church, it was kind of the one-hour Jared show. I led the singing. Uh, I led the prayer time. I preached. And so she would leave for the worship time. Then she got to where she would stay during the singing and through communion and the time of giving. But then when I would stand up to preach, she would stand up and walk out and slam the door on the way out. It wasn't like she was sneaking out. She was making it obvious that she was leaving. 
Eventually, she got to the point that she would stay through the entire service, but even then, she would not acknowledge me in any way. Before the services started, before Sunday school, I would see her walk by in the building, and I would say, good morning, Mary, and she wouldn't even turn to acknowledge that I was there. Probably the low point in that conflict came at a community spaghetti supper at a community center in town. I'd gone through the line and filled up my plate and then sat down at a table where after I sat down, there was only one seat left, and it was the one right next to me. And guess who came and sat there? Mary. And actually, I was pleased by that. I thought, this is a good sign. She's getting over this. She has chosen to sit by me. There were other places in the room where she could sit. And so I said, well, hello, Mary. And she turned and looked at me and said, oh, I didn't realize where I was sitting and moved somewhere else. Now, no one else at that table attended the little church where Mary attended and I was the preacher, but everyone else at the table knew I was the preacher at the little church that Mary attended. So the next few minutes were a little bit awkward uh, given that little exchange that took place. That conflict with Mary went on for over a year. And through that whole time, I tried to go out of my way to be nice to Mary. I would still greet her every time I saw her, even though I know she was going to ignore that I was even there. I would notice something she had done in the church and write her a thank you note for it to say, hey, Mary, I know when you organized that closet, you thought nobody noticed, but I did. And I appreciate the things like that that you do around the church building. Just went out of my way to try and be more kind to Mary than anybody else. And I wish I could say that I was motivated by just a desire to to try and imitate Christ, just to try and extend as much kindness to her out of my devotion to Christ. The truth was I did have biblical motivation, but it was a little bit different than simply trying to follow the example of Jesus. My motivation was a couple of verses in the Bible that I held to as a promise in Proverbs 25, beginning in verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him or her food to eat. If she is thirsty, give her water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on her head, and the Lord will reward you. (laughs) Folks, that was a promise from the Lord that I held on to. By continuing to be kind to her, I was heaping up the burning coals, and I knew what the reward would be. It was going to involve a lot of tears and an apology. And so for an entire year, I killed Mary with kindness, so to speak, looking forward to that reward. And I probably am not going to surprise you when I say that tearful apology never came the way that I expected But I believed that if I did my part, I would get my justice, my vengeance, my reward. And, you know, you may have listened to that story and thought, well, (laughs) that's cute, Jared, that you struggled to forgive there. But, I mean, I wish the people that I had to forgive just had ignored me in life or just avoided me or just walked out of the room. And I know that my story may not compare to what some of us have experienced at the hands of others. Some of us have been hurt physically by those that were supposed to be our protectors. Some of us carry emotional scars from verbal attacks on us in seasons that were our most vulnerable in our lives. And it's easy to say, well, you've just got to forgive and forget. But how do we do that when the hurt and the scars are still there to remind us of how we were wronged? And what about those who hurt someone we love? What about those who hurt our children? We're just supposed to forgive and forget like nothing ever happened? A few years ago, a story aired on the CBS Evening News about a mother and the struggle she faced when it came to forgiving. Let's hear her story. We end tonight with one of the most potent powers on earth. It can change lives in an instant. Everyone has it. It's the power to forgive. Watch it now in action in Steve Hartman's Assignment America. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lord. In a small apartment building in North Minneapolis, a 59 year old teacher's aide sings praise to God for no seemingly apparent reason. Indeed, if anyone was to have issues with the Lord, it would be Mary Johnson. For all you've done for me. He never had a chance. In February 1993, Mary's son. Laramian Bird was shot to death during an argument at a party. He was 20 
and Mary's only child. My son was gone. The killer was a 16-year-old kid named O'Shea Israel. I wanted justice. He was an animal. He deserved to be caged. And he was. Tried as an adult and sentenced to 25 and a half years, O'Shea served 17 before being recently released. He now lives back in the old neighborhood, close to Mary. This close. So do we say to Mary, yeah, we know your son was killed, and now his murderer lives next door, but you just got to forgive and forget. Anybody who's been hurt in a major way knows that forgetting doesn't just happen. A, a wife whose husband cheated, a parent whose child was killed by a drunk driver, forgive and forget and move on. Several years ago, Pastor Larry Osborne wrote a great little book called 10 Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe. Love that title. And in it, he wrote, anyone who's been deeply hurt knows that painful memories stick. They can't be willed away. Pray as we might, they aren't erased. The pain may lessen, the memories may fade, the nightmares may disappear, but gone for good, not often. Forgive and forget, it just doesn't practically play out that way, but it can be a myth we buy into as, as Christians. And if we look more closely at this myth, just forgive and forget, we see that it comes from our understanding of how God forgives. We are supposed to forgive as God forgives, right? We see an example of that in Colossians 3, verse 13, pretty straightforward, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And we looked at how God uh, said that as far as the east is from the west, so far are our sins from us once he's forgiven. He takes our iniquities and throws them into, hurls them into the depth of the sea. So it seems like God forgives and forgets. So let's start by unpacking how God forgives. How does God forgive? And how does forgetting really play into that? If you look at the dictionary definition of forget, it refers to an inability to recall something. It's the opposite of remembering, right? As in forgetting where you left your keys, forgetting to show up for a meeting at the office. So do those verses mean God can't remember the wrongs of people once he forgives their sins? Kind of like Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones show up and in front of God, they use their little flashy light things and boom, he, God can't remember. If we say yes, God literally forgets, now I've got a theological conundrum that I can't reconcile because I believe God is all-knowing. He knows all. So if all of a sudden there's something he doesn't know anymore, he can't remember, now he's not all-knowing, and I can't get that to kind of uh, gel and fit together. The Bible does speak of God remembering things, but when you're all-knowing as God is, remembering has a little bit different meaning than when I remember my wife's birthday. Quoting again Osborne from his book, when the Bible speaks of God remembering something, it doesn't mean that a long lost thought suddenly pops into his mind. It simply means he renews his work in the person or situation at hand. An example, Genesis chapter eight, verse one. We read, after Noah and his family had been in the ark for 180 days, floating around the flooded earth, that God remembered Noah. Now, does that mean God looking out over the earth one day said, Oh my goodness, Noah, Noah, I forgot. Gabriel, why didn't you say something? Noah, oh my bad. No, it means that God renewed his active work in the daily life of Noah. Not that for 180 days, God forgot that Noah existed. So when the Bible speaks of God remembering our sins no more, it means that he no longer responds to us in light of those sins. They no longer derail our relationship with him. They no longer garner his wrath. They're gone completely from our account, but it doesn't mean God can't remember the things we've known because an or we've done because an all-knowing God doesn't forget stuff like that. So in light of that, here's how God forgives. First of all, when God forgives in the spiritual and eternal realm, God's forgiveness wipes the slate clean. It's not that he has an inability to recall what we've done, but he treats us as if it never happened. The spiritual and eternal consequences of our sin, they're removed like a, a judge wiping the official record clean. God's able to look at us spiritually as if we'd never sinned. But number two, in the earthly realm, there can still be consequences. Second Samuel chapter 12 in the Bible, we read about the aftermath of an affair that King David had with a woman named Bathsheba. And through the prophet Nathan, David was confronted with his sin. 
Uh, David was confronted and confessed, and he cried out to God for mercy and forgiveness. And the Bible says that God did forgive David of his sin, yet David still first faced consequences. And in verses 13 and 14 of 2 Samuel 12, we read this. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. He's forgiven you. You are not going to die, but because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And as we continue reading, we see that David faces a number of consequences of his sin. The rest of his lifetime is a lifetime of war. Uh, another son of David becomes a public humiliation to him. The temple that he had dream, dreamed of building as a place of worship for God was going to be left for his son to build instead. And as Nathan said there, his son would die. So God's forgiveness doesn't mean that on this earth all the consequences consequences of our wrongdoing just disappear as if they'd never happened. I can lose my temper and treat a coworker badly and they can choose to forgive me, but it doesn't mean the relationship just goes back to exactly how it was before. If I drive under the influence of something and I cause an accident that, that injures someone, it doesn't mean that they're healed if I'm forgiven of that. If I make my career a higher priority than my wife and kids, God can forgive me for that, but it doesn't mean that they don't feel the effects of that. When God forgives, there can still be consequences. Yet even with those consequences, God's forgiveness means second chances. Yet David faced consequences, but he was still able to accomplish great things for God. He was still remembered as one of the greatest kings of Israel. He was still able to make pres preparations so that Solomon could build a beautiful temple. He was still remembered as a man after God's own heart. God's forgiveness of David didn't remove all the earthly consequences of his sin, but it did mean he got a second chance, a chance to become God, the man that God intended for him to be, not just remembered as the adulterous murderer he was before he experienced God's forgiveness. All right, so now let's go back to some of those painful experiences where we maybe wrestle with forgiveness a little bit. If forgiving isn't forgetting, what is it? What does it look like for us to forgive like God forgives us? How do we forgive like God has forgiven us? Well, first of all, we stop keeping score. Jesus, once, once, Jesus was once asked, how many times are we supposed to forgive? Matthew chapter 18, it's recorded, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Jesus was using an exaggeration to make the point to not keep score. It wasn't forgive 77 and then number 78, revenge is yours, buddy, go get it. It's not about the number of times that we forgive. It's about not keeping track. Secondly, look in the mirror. Jesus said it's pretty hypocritical when we have a plank in our own eye and yet point out the speck in someone else's eye. It's good for us to take a look at ourselves and be reminded how truly imperfect, imperfect we are, how much we've been forgiven, and then it becomes easier to extend forgiveness to others. Helps us keep things in perspective. And if, if you're struggling to remember some of the times you've fallen short, some of your shortcomings, ask the person sitting next to you right now. They'd be happy to help you remember some of those shortcomings. Our natural tendency is to overlook our own shortcomings and magnify the shortcomings of others. If we look in the mirror more often, forgiveness may come easier. Thirdly, show kindness. Jesus taught we should show kindness to those who wrong us. In Matthew chapter 5, here's how he worded it. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Showing kindness doesn't mean you condone what happened or that there aren't consequences for hurting someone. And there are times when avoiding someone who has harmed you, especially if they will continue to harm you, is what you need to do. But where possible, show kindness. Because showing kindness begins to soften our heart. And hopefully as we show kindness to the person who has wronged us, it softens their heart as well. We're told in scripture, we'll be blessed when we show 
that kind of kindness. First Peter chapter three, verse nine, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because this you were called to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Fourthly, when it comes to forgiving others, let God be God. It's so natural for us to want to seek revenge instead of granting forgiveness. But here's what Paul writes in Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and then Paul quotes the verses I read earlier from Proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As followers of Jesus, we turn vengeance over to God and allow him to take care of it in his perfect ways, in his perfect timing. Earlier, I told you part of the story of Mary, uh, the woman in the church that I served in Missouri. I need to tell you a little bit more about that story. After serving as the preacher of that little church for two years, I needed to complete an internship uh, for college, and I was going to serve with missionaries overseas, and so I had to resign as the preacher of that little church, uh, and I think they, had a, they wanted to have a party that they were getting rid of the kid, and maybe they could hire somebody more experienced, so they had a going away party, uh, a potluck, carrying meal, my last Sunday there, and at that meal, Mary pulled me aside, and she shared with me, uh, even though she was a, a widow, had been a widow for many years, she had begun dating someone and they had even picked out rings. But she also shared he was currently in the hospital. He'd just been given a bad prognosis, and she actually didn't think he would ever come home from the hospital. But then she added, Jared, we would have been honored for you to have done the ceremony. Now, I should have left town that day <laughs> saying, thank you, God. Instead, I left town that day going, whoa, wait a minute, God, that's not what you promised. She thinks I'll just agree to do her wedding after how she treated me or that I would have agreed to do her wedding after how she treated me. There was no apology in that. There were no tears of regret. God, I did my part. Where's my reward? I'm ashamed of that to this day. Fast forward a few weeks, I got a letter I was, as I mentioned, serving overseas with missionaries. It was actually in Berlin, Germany. I got a letter there from someone else in that church in Missouri, and they said that Mary's friend had, in fact, died, and Mary was really struggling with that. And so I figured out when would be a good time to call Missouri, uh, figuring out the, calculating the time difference, so made a phone call to Mary, and I don't remember what all I said, but I remember offering to pray with her. And as I was praying, I could hear Mary begin to cry on the other end of the phone. And when I finished praying, Mary said, thank you, Jared. I love you. I said, I love you too, Mary. Sometimes we have vengeance in mind, but God has something more beautiful in store when we forgive. That's the rest of Mary's story from the church in Missouri. The other Mary... From the news story, there's more to her story as well. Let's hear the rest of that. He now lives back in the old neighborhood, close to Mary. This close. He lives next door. Next door. How a convicted murderer ended up living a door jam away from his victim's mother is a story not of horrible misfortune, as you might expect, but of remarkable mercy. A few years ago, Mary asked if she could meet O'Shea here at Minnesota's Stillwater State Prison. As a devout Christian, she felt compelled to see if there was some way, if somehow she could forgive her son's killer. What'd she say to you? I believe the first thing she said was, look, you don't know me, I don't know you, let's just start with right now. And I was befuddled myself. O'Shea says they met regularly after that. When he got out, she introduced him to her landlord, who, with Mary's blessing, invited O'Shea to move into the building. Today, they don't just live close. 
They are close. Clearly, Mary was able to forgive. Unforgiveness is like cancer. It will eat you from the inside out. It's not about that other person. Me forgiving him does not diminish what he's done. Yes, he murdered my son, but the forgiveness is for me. It's for me. For O'Shea, it hasn't been that easy. I haven't totally forgiven myself yet. I'm learning how to forgive myself, and I'm still growing towards, you know, trying to forgive myself and what it is I've done. To that end, O'Shea is now busy proving himself to himself. He works at a recycling plant by day and goes to college by night. He says he's determined to pay back Mary's clemency by contributing to society. In fact, he's already working on it, singing the praises of God and forgiveness at prisons, churches, to large audiences everywhere. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. Yes, I'm grateful. Which explains why Mary can sing her praise of thanks to her audience so of one. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Minneapolis. For all you've done for me. How beautiful it is when we fully understand the vastness of God's forgiveness and can appreciate the beauty of extending that forgiveness to others. Mary recognized that forgiveness didn't mean forgetting about the death of her son. She said in that clip, me forgiving him does not diminish what he's done. Yes, he murdered my son. Sometimes there are hurts left even after there's forgiveness. But Mary stopped keeping score. She showed kindness to the man who'd killed her son and she left vengeance up to God. And that makes her a beautiful example for all of us. I'd like to close with the words of Psalm 103, the psalm that we began with as we wrap things up, again beginning in verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your forgiveness. A forgiveness because you extend it freely can seem like it didn't cost much. So, Father, we're thankful that in this season, as we lead up to Good Friday and Easter, we can remember the price that was paid by our Lord Jesus. Father, again, thank you for your forgiveness. Help us to extend that same forgiveness to others. Father, help us to look in the mirror, be reminded of how freely you forgive, and extend that same forgiveness to others, hoping that they will turn to you and find the kind of forgiveness we've experienced. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.